Yeah, it's a pleasure for me to have the opportunity to talk about a topic that's at the very heart of my uh, own uh, research interest, and that is um, how firms manage supply chain disruptions, or if you want, supply chain risk management. So, in a nutshell, what I'm going to talk about is uh, how events uh, interrupt interfirm material flows and how firms respond to these e events in order to, at the end of the day, um, sustain their business operations. Uh, so that's, the, the, in a nutshell, the short version of it. And the longer version is structured as follows. So I, I would, first of all, um, like to take a couple of minutes to actually introduce the topic and motivate uh, the, the, the kind of phenomenon that I'm interested in. Uh, which is supply chain risk and disruptions. I am very much aware that this is a heterogeneous group and many of you might not have yet uh, looked too much into supply chain management. So I will show you a couple of examples and I hope at the end of the day, in like 10 minutes, 15 minutes, you will agree that this is an important topic to study. And then I will show you a few, um, a few uh, research results from, from projects that we've conducted um, at my, in my research group in, in Mannheim. And last but not least, I round it, out, round it off with a, with a short summary. Whenever you have a question, whenever you feel like, okay, I didn't get that exactly, or maybe Christoph, that was not, or I feel there is an error in what you just said, then please interrupt me at any time. Supply chain risk, why should we care? Um, I thought I'd start with an example. Uh, so this is an example uh, back from 2005, um, so quite some, no, 15, 15 years ago, uh, 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 12 years ago. Um, this example, um, th the main player in this example is a small device uh, called a diesel injection pump. For those of you who have a diesel car, most likely you will have such a diesel injection pump in, in, in your engine. Uh, it's the kind of device, it's a pump that creates the pressure with which the fuel here, diesel, is injected in the combustion chamber, in the, in the cylinder of the diesel car. And in this area, so this is this device here, um, a firm, a Bosch, is by far the market leader, so they have more than 80% market share in this uh, field, in this space. Um, and they deliver these uh, injection pumps to automotive original equipment manufacturers, OEMs, the kind of Daimler, BMW, Nissan, and so forth. Uh, and they assemble it in their engines, and then it goes to the end customer. Now, what happened in 2005 is they delivered a faulty diesel injection pump uh, to, the, uh, to their customers. The customers uh, did not um, detect this error. Uh, so they build it into the e engines when they assembled them, and then uh, when they delivered them to the customers, they realized, okay, this engine is not working properly, and that caused standstill of assembly lines, product recalls, um, and then, of course, also consequential costs like uh, tarnishing um, brand image and, and, and so forth. Now, that happens quite often. Product recalls is not uh, something uh, spectacularly rare. But what makes this interesting is that this issue of this faulty diesel injection pump uh, was not the actual cause, was not created directly at Bosch, but way, what we say, upstream in the supply chain. So when you look at this as a, as a river, we have a material flow coming from here, uh, from the raw material pit all the way to the end consumer. And we would say this is upstream like a river, and this is downstream. And in this case, you see that the error occurred, uh, what we would say, a third-tier supplier. So this is the OAM. This is a first-tier, second-tier, third-tier supplier, um, DuPont. And they um, had just one batch of, uh, of uh, Teflon that was contaminated. Um, they delivered this batch to a customer, Federal Mogule, and Federal Mogule manufactures a small little component of this injection pump, and at the end of the day, it gets a finishing a Teflon coating. And because of this um, contaminated Teflon, the diesel injection pump didn't work properly, and then um, the, the end consumers um, received cars with engines that didn't work. So this is what I... Um, would like to highlight as a supply chain disruption. So we had here an event, and then it rippled down the supply chain and caused quite substantial costs. So here, three-digit million area, 
I don't know exactly how much it was because they don't like to speak about this, obviously. But uh, it is, was quite a big event. Right? Now, disregarding of what exactly went wrong and who bears at the end of the day the costs, uh, I, I think it's a nice example of this. And there are many others. So um, if you look at uh, the causes, quite some research that tries to uh, somehow sort the different events that could occur and hamper supply chains. So I, I know this is difficult to read, but um, it's a study from the World Economic Forum conducted together with DHL, the logistic service uh, provider. And they ask managers, what kind of events do you think are most important for your supply chains? Uh, what risks? And they then sorted them in containers, naming them environmental issues, geopolitical, economic, and then technological. And what you see is here is like natural disasters, um, terrorism, corruption, border delays, currency fluctuation, market fluctuations. So w what I would like to highlight is it's a large heterogene heterogeneous set of, of events that are somehow um, covered under the umbrella term supply chain risks which then at the end of the day might materialize and then we would call it an, a disruption. Now before, th this is the event I'm going to talk now in more detail and I, if you think about it, you could now actually legitimately argue that this is not a, 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 a completely new thing, right? So you could say um, these issues are actually as old as mankind because material flows have existed since trade and, and somehow specialization uh, took place. And it is correct. So if here are two examples. East India Company uh, that delivered spices from the East Indies all the way to Europe and made a fortune. Uh, and they were, of course, exposed to also events that interrupted their material flows. In this case, uh, extreme weather and when a ship sank. Um, major, major issue. And this is also why Lloyd's of London was created. Uh, so an insurance company covering these kinds of, kinds of risks. Or here, the famous Pony Express, Wells Fargo and Company, when they were uh, operating in the Wild West, I mean, ev every other corner, behind every other corner, there might be some raiders that tried to, to somehow uh, stop this and, and um, steal. Um, or kill, I don't know. So what you see here is maybe a first supply chain risk manager. So somebody who tried to um, um, avoid these risks. Huh? And this would be something what I call later proactive risk management. So things that you do prior to the materialization of the event in order to prevent it from happening. So in this case, proactive risk management did unfortunately not work. Uh, so we will have to look also at other things, what you could do after the event actually materialized. And this is the key thing of my, my, my talk, reactive risk management. But prior to getting to there, I would like to go back to the answer. What is so uh, particularly new about this? Why is the recent interest in these things if they are as old as supply chains have existed? Now, there's quite some research on that and I'm going to provide only an intuitive answer. Um, the main argument goes supply chains, modern supply chains have or look quite differently to what we have had in the past. And that's why the topic, I think supply chain risk management occurred somewhere end of the 90s, mid of the 90s. So it's not such a particularly uh, old uh, topic. Uh, and um, the reason is supply chains have changed. So we will, if this is a kind of, um, visualization of a supply chain. Here we have the suppliers upstream, as I said, downstream the consumers. In between we have stages like source, make and deliver. And the red things here is what we call the competitive priorities of supply chain management. So firms might pursue cost efficiency. They would like to have flexible supply chains um, depending on how the market reacts to a product so that they can um, increase production or reduce production so agility or flexibility would be a nice thing. You would like to have sh short lead times, delivery times. And of course, we would like to have always um, kind of quality according to the specifications. And in order to um, attain these goals, firms have uh, invested quite heavily in um, initiatives such as here lean production, um, 
outsourcing. I will show you on the next slide an example of a company that has less than 20% of own value added. So 80% of their products is actually not produced in-house, but it's, it's, it's purchased from, from direct suppliers. Uh, and uh, or single sourcing. So instead of contracting with multiple alternatives, you just put all your bags in one basket and say, I go with this supplier, for example, for this diesel injection pump. And if something happens to the supplier, your kind of alternatives are limited, and that means um, you become more, what we would say, vulnerable. I'm not going further down in, in this area, but the, I hope you get somehow the point vulnerability has increased. Modern supply chains, because of several efficiency-seeking uh, uh, trends or initiatives, have rendered these supply chains more vulnerable. And then there are also external factors. If you want globalization, longer paths of supply chains, um, both on the demand side and on the supply, uh, supply side, increasing industry clock speed. Uh, if you look a little bit in the automotive industry, how long cars were in the market today and how long they were in the market late, like maybe 30 years ago, you will see quite some interesting differences. And that, that, that applies to many others. I could also show you examples of Gillette with the shavers, how long a, a shaver was in the market maybe in the 80s, and how fast Gillette, for example, Procter & Gamble, is now bringing in new products, like every other year or so. And what we have also, and that's something I will talk in more detail later, are tight, tighter coupled supply chains. And that also refers a little bit to the initial example of Bosch and the, um, and the diesel injection pumps. So you could argue, why did Bosch not detect this faulty device? Uh, so apparently they were all pretty much confident, had, had trust in the, prior, in the prior tiers in the supply chain that they manufacture according to the given specifications. And uh, this is what we would say uh, more tightly coupled. It's like a domino effect. If there's sl little, little slack in between, you have the domino effect. If there's enough slack, then you can stop the, this kind of chain reaction. Now, as I said, I show you now an example from a company that produces less of 20% of its own value added uh, of, of the, the cars. I'm from Germany, so I thought it would be a good thing to show you at least on one slide a car. Now, this is a pretty much, it is a nice car. It's the current Porsche 991, uh, the seventh uh, generation 911, uh, SOP in 2011. It was facelifted 2015. Next year, we will see the new uh, uh, 911 generation, and what you see here, this is uh, the a f a kind of a, the most important direct suppliers. Uh, so, what uh, here are reflectors? The reflectors here come from Heller. Probably the lights might also come from Heller. Uh, then your braking systems might come from uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, what is it? to live. Uh, so uh, they rely heavily on external sources. Um, and uh, if you just think of my maybe 150 direct module suppliers, so it, I'm not talking about the suppliers for a screw or something. I'm talking about suppliers that deliver seats, um, um, entire gearboxes, cockpit systems, uh, Drexel Meyer, for example, a big company for, for this uh, cockpit solutions. Um, and orchestrating all these 150 suppliers so that they deliver just in time or even maybe just in sequence to the assembly line is quite a challenge. Uh, and um, that's what I call, we call complexity. Managing and orchestrating these um, um, companies so that they have all the production plans and deliver just in time at the uh, assembly line. Because what Bo Bo uh, Porsche at the end of the day does is just assembling the stuff and then that's it, and uh, give, sending it out to the end consumers. This is quite challenging, and I hope you can intuitively follow me that this creates quite a, a lot of potential for errors. Huh? Now, how, how could we manage these problems? And this is the topic of supply chain risk management. It, if you take it very simple, the cartoon here uh, says it all. Uh, you have to somehow identify potential issues 
um, then you have to assess the probability and the potential impact. That's one way of looking at risk. Um, and then you think, uh, okay, how I'm going to handle that. And that's basically it. And I'm going to talk only about this here now in the following. And uh, this is um, now a possibility to look at this risk handling that you can distinguish two areas. So one area is the proactive uh, stuff. So everything you do upfront to avoid these issues from occurring. Uh, or, um, uh, for example, uh, there's um, a Czech, uh, Czech a goalkeeper, goalkeeper um, Petr Czech. He played at Chelsea and was also one of the best keeper, goalkeepers of all time, if you want. He, he used to wear this kind of hat because he had once a major injury of his neck and afterwards he thought it's a good idea to protect his head with this little helmet. So that's some sort of a proactive approach. In case something happens, he has this cushion which avoids uh, the kind of... Um, See serious damages to his to his neck or uh, other soccer example shin guards. So why would we share shin guards? Because they somehow protect us in case of a dangerous tackling. This is a powerful approach if you know the kind of risks that could occur. Uh, but um, I will argue that in very complex, um, tightly coupled systems, it's very difficult to predict or to even. Um, identify all potential problems that might occur. And I'm not talking about the risks that an uh, um, asteroid will now crash here in my presentation, but like very um, also reasonable risks which are difficult to, which are difficult to, uh, to, to predict that they actually exist. Uh, and that's why it's also important because you can't plan for every kind of scenario that might occur that you, can, that you also look at what could I do afterwards. And if you are very astute and would, um, um, you could argue that this is no longer risk management because this is here the point the disruption occurred. This is where risk actually materialized, so there's no risk anymore. It's more of a firefighting. What, how do I solve the problem so that I can quickly get back to the normal modus operandi? I know that, uh, but still in, in the literature, it retails under the name reactive risk management. Um, and the goal of this reactive risk, ma risk management is to learn um, how to detect early warning signals, if they exist, and then also how to respond to these events in such a manner that the business functions continue without, um, uh, with little interruption. And I'm only looking now at this here. And I'm going to show you a few examples of current research projects and a few uh, insights. So this is very similar to problem solving. If you are interested in problem solving, that um, in also in other areas, decision making, psychology, and so forth, uh, then you will also remember what uh, have seen something like I show you in a bit. Um, so we have here this problem or the disruption that creates a problem that needs management. And now you could argue um, that the context matters. So getting back to my example, it will make a difference whether the supplier has just one quality issue that was just one batch that was contaminated or whether the supplier maybe because of fi ill financial health completely goes out of business and defaults. So these are different scenarios and my response will probably have to take that into consideration. If it's just one batch, well, then I will talk to the supplier or make sure some of my suppliers talk to this sub-sub supplier uh, to solve this issue. But if the supplier completely goes out of business, I will have to find an alternative source and so forth. So context matters. The response content, so what am I actually doing at the end of the day also matters. Uh, so, uh, do I develop a new supplier? Do I find an alternative? What are the kind of switching costs? Um, and in between, there's the response process. So, how do companies uh, take the context into consideration and then devise a response to come at the end of the day to an actual response or an, and, and implement it? And I'm not going to look at the content, and I'm also not looking at the context. I just assume they are now fixed for a moment 
I'm interested in the response process. So how do firms process information and then at the end of the day come up with a solution? And I'm talking about stages, I'm talking about strategies or behaviors um, of how this response process unfolds. The first thing is now the stages. So if I open the black box here, so this here, um, or blue box, if I open it now, um, then I could argue this is a problem process underlying there. So pe the, the managers, acting agents, they will have somehow to um, diagnose the problem, so understand what's going on, sense, make sense out of the situation, uh, then um, develop a, a response, and then at the end of the day, implement it. And there are lots of um, these problem-solving process models out there what I use here is a very simplistic one. So you have to recognize that there's something going wrong. Uh, you have to diagnose the situation. You develop an alternative or, or, or a set of alternatives. You choose one and then you implement it. The problem is that the situation that they have to address here, the disruption, is typically um, associated with ambiguity. So it's not so clear what are the true cause and effects, Take, get back to this example of the diesel injection pump, I'm sure that uh, the automotive OEMs will not have direct knowledge what was the real cause. They would just know the diesel injection pump isn't working properly, but what are the underlying reason and reasons and hence how could I best address this issue might not be so clear. Uh, oftentimes decisions have to, made swift, uh, have to be made swiftly, so there's some stress. And um, it might also involve surprise in the sense of, um, oh, wow, so that was a third tier supplier who at the end of the day created this problem. And the co first question that we uh, try to look at is, is it important, first of all, is speed important? Is it uh, important how fast I um, um, ad address my pr uh, this, this process? And the second associated question, do I have to work through all of these stages? Um, or is um, at, at the same speed, or are some stages more important than others? Is it more important to be very fast at recognition, and then I can take it more, uh, take it easy, or um, it, maybe is development more important than others? And we were um, we exploited a data set where we had information about supply chain disruptions, and uh, we had measures measurements for how fast firms ran through the recognition, diagnose, development, and implementation stages. And I'm not going now through the details. Um, this is um, one of the models that we were uh, running. Uh, so we were first of all testing whether the total response speed matters and then whether the individual stages, how they matter. And in, we found actually, which is not very counterintuitive, I very much agree, Speed is important, so the faster you are, the better you are actually in reducing the overall disruption impact. And the second thing is all stages. Um, the speed through which you go through all of the stages reduces um, the disruption impact. The next uh, question, okay, this is a uh, um, little bit... But uh, so this is a constraining factor model. We actually looked at the same problem, but now we asked, is there a bottleneck? So if, um, assume I'm super fast in recognition, very slow in diagnosis, super fast in development, and super fast in implementation, does it make sense to um, incre increase diagnosis? So is this then a bottleneck? Huh? And, uh, or a constraining factor. And uh, we actually did not find uh, much evidence for that. Only the diagnosis stage can act as a bottleneck. So if, I'm, if you assume uh, a model with 0% to 100%, I'm 80% here, I'm 80% here, 80% here, and here maybe at 20%, then it does not make sense to further increase here from 80 to 100% or here from 100. That is not helping me. I would have to invest first in this bottleneck and try to become faster in diagnosis. So that's the idea of a constraining factor. So um, baseline um, outcome here is um, 
you have to be fast, and um, there's not a strong constraining factor set up. Only with the kind of diagnosis, we found some sort of empirical evidence that it's, it might be um, a constraining factor. But overall, not much evidence for this. You want strong interaction between these stages. Now, the next question we ask is, if we now look at response styles, uh, how, do, how could firms best address uh, the problems that occur um, with some sort of response uh, behaviors? And uh, in the problem um, solving uh, literature, you find two main uh, strategies. One is called ready, aim, fire, and the other is called ready, fire, aim. So ready, aim, fire is the orthodox approach to problem solving. So you diagnose a problem, once you understand it, you uh, devise a response, and then you, s you try to address it. Uh, so that's ready, aim, and then I fire. Now, if you are more of a kind of cowboy uh, or um, current president, maybe I'm not, I'm not offending ho I hope anyone here, but maybe a, a, a Donald Trump style, if you like, uh, you you recognize the problem, but you don't take too much time into really s trying to come up with a solution. You first fire, and then you look at, okay, where did, I, where did it hit? And then you might again uh, um, somehow readjust. And for those of you who have served in the army, uh, tracing ammunition in the night, you can't really aim. So what you do is you somehow try to get the traces into the... So that is, is a common strategy. It's not... Uh, and we looked at um, kind of the, the uh, effic efficiency of the two approaches, ready, aim, fire. Here we have a bias for planning, bias for really un trying to understand the problem. So if you want, this is, this is the target. Disruption occurs, very blurry. I have limited information, ambiguity. It's not so clear what I should do. Uh, so I wait until kind of the uncertainty um, is uh, uncovered. Now I see the uh, target, now I start to aim, and then I shoot. I might not be a perfect marksman, but I get closer to actually the target. Now, again here, cowboy style, I have an action bias, so the problem occurs and I directly shoot. So problem occurs, I shoot, uh, okay, and then uncertainty is revolving. Um, oh, okay. And then I, I realized, okay, it was not a perfect shot, uh, so I will have to readjust. And by the way, that's also associated with culture. I lived uh, five years in Switzerland. Everybody, is somebody from Switzerland here? So the Swiss culture is definitely this here. So I tell you, it would maybe be ready, ready, aim, 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 and then fire. Uh, and, and the Germans might be also somewhere in this container. But then there are other cultures that might have, just in general, a stronger propensity to first shoot, do something, and then reevaluate how, how good your, your solution was. So we tried to model that. We used an NK uh, model framework for those of you who are using um, maybe theoretical biologists or something, no NK models, uh, to somehow model uh, decision-solving um, uh, processes in a context of complexity. And we then had um, a setup where uh, we um, modeled the environment according to its complexity, according to the uncertainty that exists at the beginning, on the onset of the disruption, and um, also past dependency. So to make it a little bit mean for, uh, for the cowboys, we um, implemented some path dependency in the sense of there's a, a couple of decisions are then burned in at, in the beginning. So you will not be able to reverse your first set of maybe three shots. They will be burned in and you will not be able to, to change that. That would be something like shadow of the past or, or past dependency and that occurs very often. So you have a problem with a supplier, you directly give the, give the supplier the boot and try to find an alternative one and then you realize, gosh, there is not a good alternative or I can't qualify this supplier. Then, then you have this problem of not being able to reverse it. 
Uh, so uh, what we see here is now one setting. So we um, had some sort of training period, which is actually uh, unimportant. The music starts to play here at period 40. This is where uh, we created a fitness landscape and threw two agents on this fitness landscape and let them do what we call local hill climbing. So they were trying to find a local uh, or maybe also global uh, optimum. Um, and uh, then we ob observed which of these two strategies is behaving better in a large number of uh, cases than to the, the mean value to understand uh, which one is better. And I'm not going to show you now the math, um, only the, the main results. So here are the parameters that we manipulated. So we had complexity, low and high. We had the response uncertainty, so that's the vagueness. So how, how clear do you see the actual, um, actual uh, um, problem? Um, we implemented a response uncertainty and we implemented um, uh, at the duration of the response uncertainty, so how long did it pertain, how many periods, and we implemented the shadow of the past. And then we had two uh, um, kind of performance measures. One is the effectiveness, so how well did they, um, did they solve this problem, and the speed. And what you see is, without going into all the details, if the, if the environment is very complex, and uh, that means it's anyway very difficult to obtain the global optimum. You live in a world which is so fuzzy that you will anyway only optimize locally. Then the cowboy is always better, because you can imagine it's just that the problem is in finding somehow a solution. You can only dream of getting a perfect solution. You need, in a complex environment, something that somehow works. So then it's more bricolage. You, you, you solve the problem, somehow contain it. And in that case, typically, the, the cowboy is the better approach. And only if we have low complexity, uh, there are instances, uh, particularly when uh, the shadow of the past is, uh, kicks in, so when you can't really reverse it, then the ready aim fire is better, kind of the deliberate response. So that you wait, don't do something until information clarifies, and then you come up with a better response. So only in these cases, uh, well, here also, um, I come back in that in a second, but typically here, where complexity is not so high, where we have a clear optimum, you just need to wait until the dust has settled, then you see clear the performance landscape, and then you can come up with a solution. Yeah. Then particularly ready aim fire is better. And here, again, this is when everything is complex, so complexity is high, response uns uh, uh, uncertainty is high, in some instances, with the shadow of the past, ready aim fire is again better. But the overall um, kind of message is, in complex environments, it's good to shoot first and then ask questions. In th uh, more simple environments, where you just have to wait, the dust has settled, and then you see pretty clearly where you are, you don't have navigation problems, you see kind of the, the, the overall optimum and you just have to climb up and then incrementally go up to this optimum, then, it's, then the kind of ready aim fire is better. And the last question where we're now um, working on is how, what kind of preferences do managers actually have? Because just because our, the mathematical model suggests that complexity um, um, needs um, ready fire aim approaches and little complexity needs ready aim fire approaches does not mean that managers actually do that. So we did a small um, behavioral experiment where we ask broad managers in a decision situation which we manipulated again with complexity, path dependency, response uncertainty and then at the end ask them given this example and if you were in this case uh, how would you res uh, 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 respond? Would you wait or would you directly do something? And um, the, what we see here, okay, the Excel, that should be the mean values, but uh, you also see, I guess, the results. So this is now showing um, mean comparison of um, response uncertainty 
or mean uh, comparisons of this intention to act with low and high response uncertainty and uh, high and low complexity. And what we see here is that when response uncertainty is very high, then managers are stunned. Uh, they, they do not react, so they, they wait. Uh, and um, particularly also with high complexity, when the complexity of the environment is very high, so it's anyway very fuzzy what is the best solution, they are also stunned, so they don't do something. Mm -hmm. And that is actually exactly the opposite to what our model suggests. We would say when complexity is high, you should do something no matter what, but um, doing something will also give you opportunity to learn about the environment. This is what the sociologist Karl Weick called enacting the environment. So you learn about the environment by doing something. Uh, so this is something where managers might act um, not optimally. And um, here we have uh, um, a situation also of response uncertainty and with past dependence. And with past dependence, uh, we see kind of the, the opposite effect. So here we have high complexity and uh, low complexity. And if we move now from low uncertainty to high uncertainty, the intention to, uh, well, this is almost zero. Um, and, and here uh, increases some, some sort of the intention to act. So what we find here is that overall, uh, participants deviate from what our model should sub uh, subscribes. And that could be like a, a possibility to come up with training modules and tell them um, when complexity is very high, then you should also think about doing something. So I'm running out of time, and that means I can sum up uh, with uh, what I've just said. So first of all, I hope um, you got the... Um, you got the message that this is an important field of research. Disruptions are important, supply chains are important, and um, the, the vulnerability has increased, so we need to somehow to get smart about how to manage these issues. Um, if I could give you one solution, then be careful and, um, and uh, maybe learn how to detect the first symptoms. So capturing early warning signals is a good idea. Um, when it comes to the stages, um, being fast is good, um, and if you should take one specific uh, stage in consideration, it's the diagnosis stage. So properly diagnosing what's going on might be helpful. And when it comes to the strategies, apparently this ready, fire, aim. So first do something, and then you look at uh, how well your um, um, uh, solution um, uh, was might overall be the best approach unless you're in very simple environments and if you don't have much past dependencies, so if you can somehow reverse also what you did. And last but not least, um, managers are stunned by complexity, they are stunned by high uncertainty. So this is, uh, this is a problem but because particularly in settings of high complexity, you sh it would be good to just do something and vice versa. In situations where they should not act and better wait, they have some sort of a bias for action. So if it, it um, there's some, some sort of, a, I think it's also clear from a management ethos, you're paid for doing something and you're not paid for sitting around. So in this case, managers have rather do something than when they should actually wait. And uh, yeah, so that would be it. I hope you liked it. I'm three minutes over time. Um, if you have questions, I'm very happy to answer them. Thank you very much.